good evening and welcome. The family thanks you for joining us for a night of remembrance and honoring a wonderful man. Wilbur was a man that I didn't get to know until just a few years ago. I knew he was from Eddyville. I had heard about him, believe it or not, back in the year of 1957. That was Wilbur's senior year in high school, I believe. In the fall of 57, Griswold High School in Western Iowa welcomed a new girls basketball and baseball coach. His name was Ed Chris, and some of you probably don't have real fond memories of Ed Chris. He was a bulldog. There was no getting around it. But he brought to Griswold a classmate of mine, Wayne Chris. Wayne spent his senior year in Griswold, Iowa. Don was a sophomore, and Norm was in junior high. Wayne and Don would tell me about the teams that they played. They played for North Mahaska, well, New Sharon at that time. And he would tell, they would tell me about the teams at Eddyville, that they were really good. And he would mention names like Veru and Kirkman and Powell and Smith and Schleyer and some of these other names that I finally get to meet tonight. <laughs> you guys had a great a great run through high school. We're going to honor William Wilbur tonight, and before we do, let's just pause and ask God's blessing upon this meeting tonight. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us in so many ways. Wilbur's been a blessing to so many people, and Lord, we just thank you for him. We're going to miss him. We're hate, we hate to see him go, but Lord, you know what's best. And Father, we just ask that you would bless this service tonight. Just use it for your glory. And thank you for the time that we can share. For we ask in thy name, amen.
One thing about starting high school track meets and John Deere tractors is that you can't hear a thing when you get old. <laughs> and I wasn't sure whether the song was over or not. I had to give my wife's intention. Is it over? Yeah. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> well, before we start tonight, I, I want to share from the scriptures just a brief encounter in the book of Proverbs which I think describes Wilbur. Wilbur was a wise man, and he actually collected so many things. I remember this week going with Linda over to his apartment, and I was literally blown away. What a collection. <laughs> wow. I mean, I've been all over the world, and I've seen, I've been to certain museums that didn't have near as much stuff. <laughs> and he jammed it all in three rooms. <laughs> I just could not believe what I saw. But anyway, in the book of Proverbs, it describes, blessed is the man that finds wisdom. And in the 13th verse, it says this, blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from wisdom is better than the gain from silver, and her profit is better than gold. Wisdom is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are the ways of pleasantness, and all of her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her, and those who hold fast to wisdom are called blessed. Wilbur was blessed with a great amount of wisdom. And before we go any further, I want to call Mike Williams up here to share just a few things Mike was a partner of Wilbur's, I won't say in crime, but I think you were in a lot of good places. Don Wilbur, yes. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to extend my sincere condolences to, I call Wilbur Vro, but being in Iowa, I know there's another pronunciation. So pardon me, but I, it was Will Vro for me, but anyway. Uh, I'd like to extend my condolences to the family on your time of bereavement. Uh, and I'd like to also thank Linda and Max for their uh, great hospitality. Uh, Ken and I, who's another friend of Wilbur from way back, we got in on the train yesterday in Ottumwa. And uh, Linda was graceful, grateful enough to pick us up. And we had dinner and ate our faces off because she's a great cook. But anyway, <laughs> um, I, uh, my name is Michael. And Wilbur was my friend. I, uh, he was my BFF, if any of you guys know what that means, if you're on the internet. He was my best friend forever. I first met Will when I was 21, and I was a budding junior executive taking my first job in Chicago. I'm from Washington, D.C. And um, I was at a bar one night after work, and I'm young, I'm 21, you know, and this guy comes up and he says, hey, man, you look like you, look like you had a bad, hard day. And I said, you just don't know. But anyway, um, we started talking, and he was a sports guy. I played uh, high school ball, and I was a star. I played college ball. So we got to know each other from that moment. We shared that uh, 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 same thing in common at that moment. And so um, we became best friends forever. So through the years, the one thing about Wilbur that I learned early on was that Wilbur was never judgmental. Now, he'll get with you if you cross him. He'll get with you, but <laughs> he was never judgmental. He met people where they were. And I was young and didn't know Chicago, and he kind of showed me around Chicago. But by that first winter, that was the winter where it was like 80 below. I said, Wilbur, I, I made a mistake. I, I can't stay here. I, 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 it's too cold. 
because he had been to, he had been in, in Minnesota as well. So I said, I, I gotta go, man. I can't stay here. It's eighty below zero. I've never been in temperatures below zero. I did not know it got to be eighty below zero. <laughs> so he says, Mike, just chill out. I'll show you how to. I'll show you the ropes. And he taught me how to, you know, put the Vaseline and the thermal underwear, and and I, I got to deal with the weather. And the rest is history. I ended up staying and had a, a career with U.S. Steel. I worked for U.S. Steel. And at the time, Wilbur was working for the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Uh, he was administrating the office. So that's how we kind of like clicked. Um, but the one thing that he and I had a passion for, and at that time, I didn't know he had a passion for antiques and collections. I didn't know. And one thing we had a passion for, he was a Minnesota Viking fan, and I was a Washington Redskin fan. So we would always talk sports, and both of us at that time were avid Bulls fans. So we were so avid that we would get tickets to the games, and we would go to the store before the game, because the Bulls were good at that time. We would bring broomsticks to the game. Now here you got these two, two guys bringing brooms into the stadium, but later on, everybody started bringing them, and it was, it was uh, synonymous with we were going to sweep whoever we were going to play. We are going to sweep them. We gonna, we gonna so we were going to games and yelling and scream. So that's some of the things we had, had in common. And we both played in a bar league in Chicago. And, you know, Wilbur played ball in Eddyville. He shared that story. He was a high school ball player, and, and, you know, I played in high school, and I was a star and all that. I went to college and played ball. But in the bar league, we were so good that we won the championship like six years in a row until the league kicked us out. <laughs> <laughs> they said, get out. You got we were that good. And the thing of it was, it wasn't good for the league to have you guys keep winning and nobody else wins a championship. But anyway, we had a great time. A lot of pitchers from, from that era uh, during that time. And I, I can remember a time, one of the times where I thought I lost him. Um, I can't remember the year, but the building that Wilbur lived in in Chicago that came across the news feed was ablaze. One morning I woke up and the Paxton was on fire. And I'm going like, oh my God, that's where Wilbur lives at. So I'm frantic trying to make calls to find out uh, where he, is he okay? And the news feed was that a lot of people didn't get out. And so for two or three days, I was frantic because I had thought I lost my friend in this fire because that building had bars on all the windows. Nobody could get out. They were trapped. So three days later, I get a phone call, and it's Wilbur. He was not home at the time of the fire. He was on, on, uh, he was on business in San Francisco. And I was says, oh, my God, Wilbur, had you been there, you probably would have perished with all the other folks. So that was one of my moments with him that I was saying, man, I'm so glad that you're okay. I'm glad you weren't in that fire. It just wasn't your time, you know. Um, but those are some of the things that uh, he and I would go through. Because when you know somebody for 47 years, a lot can happen in 47 years. And I ended up leaving Chicago and t uh, a career move and moving to Detroit where I worked in automotive. And we sort of stayed in contact. And, and by that time, I think Wilbur was retiring. And he said he was going back home to um, Oskaloosa. And I said, cool. So you fast forward, I came to Oskaloosa to visit him in 2014. That's where I met Linda and Max uh, and some of the, and um, you have got to be Taylor. I know it, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. You were young then, and you were into uh, making uh, tractors, and you had won a, a big contest or something. I remember that. And Wilbur just loved you. <laughs> <He> said, <"Let laughs> <laughs> so uh, I came here, and I'm a city guy, and I didn't know Iowa. I had never been here. So he said, come on in, we'll stay. So I got to his house. He picked me up in the tumble, and I saw all of this these antiques. I said, oh, my God, what is this? I didn't know you was OCD. <laughs> it was like tons of stuff, but it was gorgeous. And I learned another part of him that I didn't always see, his passion for antiques. 
So he wanted to share that with me, and we were we would go um, to antique shows, and I met Mary, who's into uh, 50s antiques. It was a different way of life that I had never been exposed to. So we're at this antique place. It's a huge, and I'm overwhelmed because it's all this stuff, and I'm going like, oh, my God. So I said, Wilbur, I'm ready to go. <laughs> he said, no, we're not finished. We're going to see the rest of the stuff. I said, no, I want to go. <laughs> so he said, I'll fix you. So we're out front. He gets in the car, and he drives off. <laughs> and here I am sitting there going like, what just happened? <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, he ended up driving around the building and coming back. I said, you dog. I can't get <laughs> but anyway, we had that kind of relationship. And I remember him having two birds. And one of those birds just didn't like me. I would get up in the morning and come into the living room, and this bird would be chirping back at me, and I'm going like, <laughs> he said, oh, he's okay. He's always chirping like that. But it's those kind of moments when people welcome you into, your ho into their homes and befriend you. They're never judgmental, you know, that made our friendship really solid. And when Wilbur started, to started deteriorating, he would, he would call me, and he had an eye problem. Then he had a, a foot foot problem showed me that and I said man you know what no one told us that if you keep on living some stuff is going to go wrong with you too you know just keep on living um, and then I got the news that uh, he, he was in the hospital and what was um, additionally stressful was I didn't get a chance to say goodbye because excuse me because I couldn't visit him because of COVID. You couldn't go see anybody in the nursing homes because COVID restriction prevented you from doing that. And Linda told me that even if you were to come, we probably wouldn't recognize you. So I was thinking I gotta get closure. I gotta see my buddy, you know, whatever the case may be because God's gonna be God. He doesn't make any mistakes. And when the Lord wants you to come home, guess what? You're gonna come home. You're not gonna tell the Lord, can you wait a minute? I'm busy right now, or can you come back later? Doesn't work that way. Because he's going to come, and uh, you're going to go to a better place. So I'm convinced that Wilbur's in a better place now, and no more pain, no more suffering. And the one thing I want to want to leave you with, and I hope that wouldn't cheer up, but I can't help it. But anyway, um, there's this thing called memories, and the one thing about memories I've learned in my life is that they're yours, and nobody can take them away from you ever. So for Wilbur, I have my memories, and your memories are stored in your heart and in your head. So anytime I want to remember my best friend, he's in my heart, and I'll call up my memories, and I'll be just fine. So I want to say rest in peace, Wilbur. Uh, I will see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. I believe in the interest of time, maybe I'll just forego the reading of the obituary. You all have it. You can read it. Uh, it's Wilbur's story. That's all there is to it. We got some other things to add to Wilbur's story. And my wife, you start waving your hand if I get too, for, too far into this thing. But, uh, and it's all right for you to get out your watch and look at it. Just don't beat it on your hand to see if it's still running. I've got too many former students in this room, and they know that I can get a little long-winded, especially if I'm telling stories, and I like to do that. But w Wilbur, I call him an Eddieville masterpiece. There'll never be another one like him. He, he was a masterpiece. He loved Eddieville and the memories that he treasured from there. The only, the only thing that I can find fault with Wilbur for is that he was a Cub fan. <laughs> How 
how can a guy grow up in South Central Iowa and not be a Cardinal fan? I don't understand that. Did you do that to him in Chicago? <laughs> oh, well, we'll take them all. It doesn't matter. But he also loved the Bulls and the Vikings. One of the highlights of Wilbur's life was when a great, ne a great nephew won tickets to a Vikings game. And he gave them to Wilbur, and Brent Pearson took him to that game, and that was a special thing in Wilbur's life. He loved the Vikings. Well, <clears throat> like I said earlier, I didn't come to know him until uh, late in life. But I also found a lot of things about him and his athletic career. There was a time back 20 years ago or so that, I wrote a column in the Oskaloosa Herald called Tales of the Ancient Sportsman. And I had a section in there where I would cover things that happened 75, 50, and 25 years ago. And I went through Wilbur's 50-year time. And his name was often in the Oskaloosa Herald for his basketball exploits. He was a basketball player. And he loved him. In fact, one of his teammates, I think it was Richard Kirkman, uh, made a statement that Wilbur never, shot, never saw a shot that he didn't like. <laughs> you understand that, don't you? You put him up from 30 feet. That, mean, that means you had to lead the team in assists. Because uh, well, yeah, he wasn't a passer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well... I thought tonight, on a more serious note, that perhaps you've heard coaches say, you've got to play all four quarters to win. You can't just play the first and second quarter or the first and third. You've got to play all four. And I saw some coaches sitting around in here somewhere a while ago, so I know Somebody's probably said that to you more than once. But anyway, I'm going to break Wilbur's life up into four quarters. Now, his first quarter was his childhood. He was born on a farm out west of Eddyville, but they quickly moved to town, and he grew up on the streets of Eddyville playing with the kids in town riding bicycles all over, uh, going up to the school playground and playing on the playground and perhaps playing a little work up on the baseball diamond or shooting baskets in the park. Whatever it might be, I'm sure he was there. And that time was very special to Wilbur. He loved growing up in Eddyville. And in that first quarter, I'm just reminded of the scripture that says Jesus loves the little children. He said bring the little children unto me. And Wilbur was raised in the Reformed Church which is now Faith Community in Eddyville and he heard many of the things growing up and learned many of the verses growing up that we find familiar today. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He also probably learned Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside the still waters. He may have already also read the and learned the verse that says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So those were important things to Wilbur as he grew up. Now we go to the second quarter, and here's where he becomes a young man. He learns the things about high school sports, teamwork, playing together, 
all of those things. I don't know whether at that time, no, it's you. I, I want to wander around. I got to stay close to this thing. But <laughs> I can't stand still when I'm talking. But anyway, in Wilbur's class, 1957, were you called Eddie Zen or were you Rocket Zen? Do you know, Jim? I think Leroy Powell told me at one time that they were eddies up to about 55, 56, somewhere in there, and then became rockets basically because of Gary Thompson and the rolling rockets that were so good in high school basketball in Iowa. And I think that's where the rockets came from. And we're rockets today. Once a rocket, always a rocket. <laughs> All right. Well, he loved his high school sports, he loved his teammates, and he built a lot of strength and character in that time. In fact, Isaiah 35, verses 3 to 4 says, strengthen, strengthen, your, strengthen weak hands and make Make firm weakness. Be strong and fear not. I'm sorry, I should have brought my Walmart cheaters along. I can't read my own writing. But to strengthen those hands, and Wilbur did that while he was young. He strengthened his hands. And you know, <laughs> Jim and Jerry and some of you people around here, you know what I'm talking about here. We didn't have to have a weight room. It wasn't necessary. Because when you worked with 70, 80, 90 pound bales all day, <laughs> you didn't need a weight room. I remember as a high schooler, we baled hay or shelled corn until 6 o'clock, shut it down, and went to the ball diamond. That was the way of life. That's how we did it. We didn't have to have all this weight lifting and strength training and things like that. Well, anyway, that was the second quarter. He's up to halftime now. And in the third quarter, he experiences the things of adult life. First, it was the Army. And he spent, I believe, three years in the Army. Linda told me that he worked as a secretary for a three-star general. He carried a lot of important things in his briefcase. But Wilbur was the type of guy that could do that and could be trusted. Mike, you know what I mean. Yeah. Well, that general was promoted to four-star, and he wanted Wilbur to go with him. But Wilbur says, no, I've had enough. I want to go home. He loved his hometown. We all have that. We all have an, uh, a, a desire to return to our hometown. That's why he worked so hard in the uh, Alumni Association, the Eddyville Blakesburg Fremont Alumni Association now, but it was just the Eddyville. Wilbur did a lot of work in that. He was very involved. And he loved that kind of work. And he loved meeting old friends and old classmates at those functions. I happen to have the honor of attending the last one that Wilbur went to. They asked me to give the invocation. And I said, well, I, I didn't graduate from here, but I spent enough time to earn my stripes, I think. <laughs> 29 years ought to have been enough. So I was so glad to do that. And Wilbur had a wonderful time that evening. It just, you could tell that it, it just was so special to him. Well, he served in the government for 34 years, it was. Yeah. And that's where you came in, in contact with him. But he came back home and he got involved with antiques and collecting. Flea markets. Oh, my goodness. I don't know whether he ever went there or not, but I took a 
travel group to Shipsawana, Indiana, to the world's largest flea market. 40 acres of flea market. Oh, my goodness. Wilbur would have gone crazy if he was in there. I know. He would have loved it. And he might have been there sometime. I don't know. I have no idea. Do you know, Linda? I don't think so. But anyway, he found some partners here in Oskaloosa that also loved antiques and collecting. And they were regular attenders of flea markets, antique sales, auctions, you name it. He bought so many things. I, I thought he was going to have to bu buy another house just to put all of his stuff in, but he never did. I had a neighbor lady once that bought two houses and filled them full of, quote, junk. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, junk is the stuff we keep. Stuff is the junk we throw away. <laughs> uh, well, anyhow, brings us to the fourth quarter. I see a lot of you here tonight that are probably in the fourth quarter. You're running out of strength. You're beginning to feel weak. And everything is more difficult. And did you notice that I don't care where you are, it's uphill. Everything goes uphill anymore. Well, that's a part of the fourth quarter. It's hard to keep up and life gets harder. And you know, when Wilbur's Vikings are playing at the, near the end of the fourth quarter is a two minute warning. I had an idea that I might have had the two-minute warning when I had COVID so bad. And some of the rest of you have fought through the two-minute warning, and you're still pressing on toward the goal. Wilbur was doing fine until a broken pelvis, is that right, or hip, pelvis? That made it so he couldn't get up the stairs to his apartment. Max and Linda were so kind to take him in. And he was making progress. He was getting stronger. He was looking forward to going back to his apartment. And then one morning, she found him after he'd had a stroke. And that stroke meant that he had to go to a nursing home care center. And things went downhill for him from, th from that time. He was approaching the goal line. He was almost there. And Linda tells me on that final day that she was holding his hand. And she said, Wilbur, Jesus is waiting for you. Your mom and dad are waiting for you. And she says, Wilbur was trying to say something, but he just kept squeezing her hand harder and harder before he passed away. I have an idea that Wilbur reached the goal line at that time. It's something I have to ask. The gospel is such a clear thing. But we each are approaching that goal line. And whether we make it or not is strictly up to us. God has set the plan. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you have reached the goal line, and he's ready to take you home. But if you've not made that choice, I can only implore you to do so. I can't do it for you. 
Nobody else can do it for you. It's up to you. You have to accept that gift. It's free. Nothing we can do. We can't buy it. We can't do a thing to, to earn it. It's a personal thing. And so tonight, I would just leave that with you. I trust you've made that decision to serve him. Get into his word. The book of John, the book of Romans are two of the prime books of scripture. Those are, for the new believer, are incredible books. There's also the Psalms and the Proverbs, which you need to read. Don't turn his word away. Receive him. And so we bring this to a close, and I want to just close in prayer here, but before we do, the military rights are going to be held out on the lawn. And so when you're dismissed from here, they'll dismiss you from here. If you wish to stay for the military rights, just go out to the front lawn, and we'll take care of it there. To Wilbur's family, my condolences to you. I miss him. You're going to miss him. You had the privilege of calling him Uncle Wilbur or whatever you might have called him. But he was special to you. And I just thank you for the opportunity to share tonight things on my heart. Wilbur loved Eddieville. And I'll tell you what. I learned to love Eddieville as well. It was a special place to me. One of the best breaks I ever got in life was to come to Eddieville. So thank you so much, and God bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you just have blessed us tonight with the memories of this great man. What a joy it has been to have him in our midst. And Lord, we're going to miss him. And there's going to be times of loneliness and times that we just think we can't go on without him. But, Lord, we just trust that you have him in your care. And, Lord, we ask that you would bless the military rights and the things that follow here tonight. Take us safely home and just thank you for this opportunity. For I ask in the name of our Savior, amen.